Like you don't have really have much to do, especially this is before smartphones and laptops and that that you can actually do on the on the plane on the jet right. at the you know at the airport. You know how did you how did you keep that balance when you had to do so much work to grow and still you know realize oh hey I'm married and I've got kids and you know I've got monthly bills and I've got you know I've got objects possessions. How was it that you really learned? you really figured out that balance in life. I was blessed to have been married to two wonderful women, Marcia Gay, who passed away. She had cancer. Uh, and she she didn't do as good a job as Gigi has because she was part of the, we've gone from broke to we're making money. She was on the Learjet a lot herself. Uh, but she was one that kept, kept me balanced. And 90% of the time, if she was with me on the road, our oldest son, young Ben, was with us. Uh, so she brought family, even if I wasn't bright enough to be with family. When I finally got the message, was about 25, 26 years ago when I asked Gigi to, to let me pursue her. It took me five years to catch her for another reason that we might get to before we're done, but it took five years to catch her. Um, but when I finally got her to say yes, she was in love with me and would marry me, she knew the uh, she knew my past. She knew about the 300 seminars a year. She knew that uh, I used to talk about Ben would be, young Ben would be this tall when I left on a trip and this tall when I got back. I mean, I could see a noticeable difference when I, you know, they grow fast at that age, but they don't grow that fast. That's from not seeing them every day. Right. So I got balance in my life when Judy said she wouldn't marry me. And it's a long discussion of negotiations we went through, but in result, she would not marry me unless I cut back from 300 seminars a year to 24 no more than three in any one month, no speeches within 50 miles of home. I had to clarify how far away Tahoe was at 60, because I give quite a few talks up there. So once I realized we weren't wiping out Lake Tahoe, I said, fine, and no local clients. Well, if you ever visit Placerville, you know that that was an easy one. I said, oh, no, no local clients. Are you sure? I'm serious. I said, all right. So I gave in. I really don't think the local hardware store with its 12 employees could afford my daily fee, nor would they want to, nor would I advise them to. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that much to share with 12 people in a hardware store. So that was it. She, you will not marry me unless we have something much closer to a normal semblance of life. And that brought the, I'd like to say age and wisdom and, and so on. And that was a factor. But uh, the real fact was Gigi said, no, <laughs> we're not going to live that way. She'd heard the stories, not going to live that way. Right. Well, that's, uh, so the, the Gigi's uh, ultimatum is really what, uh, what got that, that balance. Finally uh, drove the point, as we used to say in a couple old stories in the South, you know, plop, you go, oh, no one ever explained it to me that way before. Uh, well, that's what happened. <laughs> Gigi finally explained it to me where right. I could understand it. You love me. You want to spend the rest of your life with me. Uh, and I feel the same way. But we're not going to do it unless. And I had some demands of hers. I said, then you must let me do the laundry and the dishes. And, the, and she agreed to that. And she hasn't washed a sock in the last 25 years. So awesome. I, put, I put my foot down there. Right. <laughs> you definitely uh, negotiated that battle like a closer. Yeah, yeah. I'm a closer. <laughs> exactly. So, all right. If I do this for you, then then you can't do dishes or or laundry. And I know exactly. exactly. Yeah. But um, uh, so you know, and and I think we've covered this one, and it and it kind of goes, it kind of piggybacks off the last question. When and how did you realize you had it? figured out. And, you know, I was watching actually today, I had YouTube on and our, our video came up when I was getting ready and the phone was in the other room. And it was our, our first, our first interview and the YouTube video came up and I was listening to it and, and you talked, you know, like, I can't get it perfect because I've, I've had a super busy day. And my mind's, my mind's slower right now is after working all day. And, but you talked about, you know, you, you kept kind of like climbing up, right. And you didn't know where you were going. And then you took off like a rocket ship. 
Yeah, I was referring to when I joined the, the business uh, to start with. I always had always been number one here, number one there. I was the chief Krispy Kreme donut salesperson in school. I won the Columbia bike. There's no real money involved. I was, you know, number one, my dad's company, number one in a manufacturer's representative company, but there was no money, money involved. And uh, so September 15th, 1965, when I really stumbled into something that could turn into something, Zig and I both did on the same day in the same meeting. Uh, I, I didn't realize, I just answered a little ad, if you want to make more money, if you know anything about marketing plans and want to make more money, call, but um, so I called it, went to the meeting, joined the company. And the, what I was relating to was, you, you know, I'm just, why I'm, I'm Ben Gay, just a friendly guy who figured that uh, if he had a smile, a handshake, and a pretty good personality, that would be enough to get ahead in selling. Hadn't worked up to that time, but I, I figured that was just because of time. It would kick in at any minute. I didn't realize selling was a profession that, like brain surgery, had to be learned. So, not knowing I was about to be forced into learning scripts and presentations and so on by Bill Dempsey, one of the dance instructors from North Carolina, uh, who uh, became a dear friend, but was sort of on the raggedy edge of a lot of things, uh, until he forced me into learning scripts and how you present something and what's really going on in a sales presentation. It wasn't happening for me. But I said, I walked up a ramp, and I uh, sort of allude to my time at working with NASA. I walked up a ramp, door slammed behind me. I looked around, didn't realize I was on a rocket ship, and it took off. Uh, it went from a little-known company to the largest MLM direct sales company on Earth uh, rather quickly. It was just about a year old when I joined it, and I didn't know it, but was struggling to pay its bills, but was paying them. And rather quickly, we were doing real well, and shortly after that, within a year and a half, two years after I joined, we were taking in a million dollars a day, $10 million a day adjusted to today times 365, I figured out the other day for the first time, is 3.6 billion with a B dollars. Uh, I did not join a company that said, if you think you can join, work your way up and become president of the company, and it'll be a 3.6 billion. I wouldn't have dialed the number. I literally, I would have ruled my, I said I'm not qualified, I would have ruled myself out if I had read that. So it was literally a surprise. I earned my way each step of the way, I moved up, I met people. I didn't meet Earl Nightingale by accident. Uh, I didn't meet J. Douglas Edwards by accident. I worked, earned, and maneuvered my way into position. People say, you've led such an interesting life and you've met all these people. If we ever get to spend some real time together in a seminar, I will explain to you carefully, none of it was by accident. I set out to meet and work with interesting people. And I succeeded. But it was, Arnold Palmer was asked about the 20 some odd holes and one he's had. And they said, you know, that's really lucky. And Palmer said, no, uh, a hole in one itself technically is lucky. Being within a foot and a half of the hole thousands of time is skill. Now, once you get in that circle, the ball actually falling in, there's a, luck, a bit of luck involved there. But the skill is being there, being there, being there. And that's what I did with my career. I was there, I was there, I was there. I was never home taking a nap when there was an opportunity to make money or meet interesting people or learn something. That's, uh, that's great advice right there. You were never taking a nap when you had the opportunity to meet someone or, or meet a client, pick up business, uh, hang out with interesting people, or learn something. That's, uh, right. Or make money. Or make money, right. Yeah. And, uh, no, that's uh, that's a, a great share right there. And, you know, so so here's a question, and, and I do a lot of coaching, and so I, I really most of my coaching business is entrepreneurs. Most of my training business is, is the car business. But what was your biggest fall when you were doing too much? Uh, I lost a marriage, uh, and then having not learned quite enough, it was a different reason. I mentioned the two wonderful women I've married. Yeah. I married I married three. 
that <laughs> that leaves one out of the wonderful woman category. However, in all two cases that ended, and I'm, I fight desperately every day to make sure my marriage to Gigi goes to the end of my life. Uh, but in the situations that got screwed up, it was my fault. I was paying attention to the wrong things, uh, working too hard, not having the life balance we were talking about, and uh, uh, paying too much attention to the roar of the crowd and the flashing light bulbs. Uh, Bill didn't give me the letter soon enough, and when he gave it to me, I may not have learned it as quickly as I should have. Now I share it to other people like I'm an old guru. Uh, first, I learned from it, and it is so, so true. Nothing is more important than your integrity and the reputation for your reputation for your integrity. Nothing is more important than health and a good family life. You know, I've been I'm like Pearl Bailey and uh, uh, who said it first? One of the old vaudevillian ladies. They both said it. Pearl Bailey was more famous for it. I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is better. Zig, people say, Zig, well, money can't buy happiness. I said, no, happiness. No, but it allows you to pick your miseries. So uh, I understand the value of money and that you can make money and be happy. It doesn't buy happiness, but you can make money and be happy. They're almost two different issues. Uh, the trick is, if you had to pick one or the other, what would you pick? I would rather live under a bridge with Gigi than in a mansion with some of the other people in my life. Oh, that's a, that's a good statement right there. Yeah, I think uh, I think happiness uh, trumps um, you know success and wealth every time because yep. uh, I worked for an owner once and and he, he was talking about one of his super rich friends and he was really wealthy and he said you know I think the guy uh, the guy's you know pissed off and, and miserable two hours before he gets up and he's like. <laughs> <laughs> 4 a.m. and he doesn't get up till 6 a.m. and he's like where's this guy I know and he was really wealthy and he's like he's the richest guy I know and the most miserable person I've ever met yeah well he'd probably be miserable under a bridge also right. there are some, some people every morning get up looking for trouble and they usually find it by about 10 o'clock in the morning right. I'm just a bright sunny guy you can try and kill me blow up my cars blow up my house and I'll go whistling down the driveway and go start another business right no that's uh that's very impressive and here's a uh here's a question that, that hermillo asked and he said please clarify objection and condition and how to handle each okay uh, by definition uh this isn't my explanation uh, doug edwards and other people taught me uh, an objection is can be real. I see all this stuff on Facebook and so on with salespeople. If you have an objection, that was a terrible presentation and blah, 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 and so on. It may be that they didn't want what you were selling. And no amount, you can string all the words together you want if they don't want one of those. Uh, and uh, even if they can afford it, if they don't want one, that's uh, bordering on a condition, not an objection. An objection is uh, you haven't explained to me properly why this car is $20,000 better than that car. That's an objection. And if, and if you know the answer, if there is an answer, you can overcome that. You should have overcome it in the beginning. If you were a sales infiltrator, uh, as explained in the closers part, part two, last chapter, best thing ever written about selling. I wrote it. Thank you very much. Uh, if if that's an objection and you're a sales infiltrator, it was covered up front. I don't hear all these objections other people have because I cover them up front. Not every single objection, I set up the conditions. I'll be straight with you. I sell on a straight, straight basis. I'll be straight with you. You be straight with me. That means I'll tell you the truth. You tell me the truth. Don't, you know, suddenly come up with your Uncle Harry who's an accountant in Chicago and you got to talk to him. You and I know you don't have an Uncle Harry in Chicago. And if you did, he wouldn't be an accountant. So, you know, I won't do that nonsense to you. You don't do that nonsense to me. So I set up the boundaries up front 
then I give an honest presentation about a product that I sincerely believe in, that I believe you need or want to make your life better, or we wouldn't be talking. I don't give random presentations to people I don't bump into on the street. One way or the other, you have to have qualified yourself personally, financially, spiritually, whatever. You have to be qualified or reasonably qualified 